Would you say that to me? He's looking for an angle. You know those snide ad men you see in the movies? What's so urgent? London Bridge falling down? In a manner of speaking. How long have you been together? Ten, Ten years. years. You think it's so uncomfortable that I won't even bring it up? He understands completely. He's just playing it up. If you don't like what is being said, change the conversation. How can you talk that way to me in the condition I'm in? The plans, the plans, the plans you make. Welcome to Mad Men Men, the weekly show where we discuss a show that used to come out weekly. Each week, we take a close look at an episode of the AMC series Mad Men, which ran from 2007 to 2015, and we're changing the conversation of the show all these years later, where one of us is a first-time watcher of Mad Men. One of us went through it one time back when it was airing, and then there's me who watches it like once a year. In the spirit of new things, I changed the intro. How about that? Because it's an episode all about change. So I was like, you know what? This is a good opportunity to maybe do a little fresh take because uh, anyway, I'm John Agroni, fresh from my most recent visit to Terrytown. And uh, here we, of course, have the wonderful, the unbelievable, the guy who insists on making us sound like podcasters. It's Will Ashen. What up? And then we have the communist, the radical, and I don't want that kid on my podcast. It's Mike Overholz. Bye, bye, birdie. Is that how it goes? Better than Peggy, <laughs> quite honestly. <laughs> um uh here's a couple more that i had uh what we lost in london we gained in podcasts uh look i didn't i didn't want to be there any more than you did it was just the cherry on top of my podcast um oh <clears throat> this one's my favorite uh will ashton he understands completely he's just podcasting it up that one has layers um i could give two craps about that wedding all i want to do is podcast and uh, this is what this is what will thought i was thinking during my wedding uh why do you people insist on making us sound like podcasters if you don't like what's being said, change the podcast. Okay, this is a better one. I was in California. Everything was new, and it's clean. The people are filled with podcasts. Uh, this was almost your intro, Mike. Uh, you're an army man, Mike. Drop your socks and podcast about something. And then this is my other one for you, Will. You're not an artist, Will Ashton. You record podcasts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I see you nodding uh, in agreement. We're, we're getting to the point where I swear to God, you just like the in, like the only reason we're doing this is for your intros. Like pretty much, yeah. The reason the show exists. So the animals are running the podcasts. The podcasts, the podcasts, the podcasts you make. <laughs> I accidentally skipped one, um, but this is the last one. I promise. Uh, let's also say that change is neither good or bad. It simply is. It can be greeted with terror or joy. A tantrum that says, "I want it the way it was," or a podcast that says, "Look, it's something new." We should write that hey, into like our blurb, like our summary. The writer strike is affecting everybody differently, <laughs> dude. And I just, <laughs> yeah, it's a good for one. sure. Uh, yeah, well, uh, welcome, guys. We were talking about Love Among the Ruins, season three, episode two, directed by Leslie Linka Gladder. Let me double check. I, I think she did an episode last season. She did two episodes last season: A Night to Remember, and before that, The Benefactor. Uh, Benefactor being one of my least favorite episodes of last season so um what are you gonna do and then she also did 5g in the first season one of my favorite episodes of that season so uh the writers here and uh yeah i assume they're on strike uh katherine humphreys and uh, matthew weiner although i don't think he's still working at least at the moment all right um love among the ruins before we get into it mike overholz how did how did you how did you find this episode uh you know re-watching it because uh, i know Season three, we haven't had a big discussion yet about uh, our thoughts. I mean, I know last time we talked about how this is like a ro- you know we're no longer on a roller coaster. It's just sort of like a racetrack in terms of quality. Yeah, yeah I think. Uh, I mean, I talked about it in our last episode. I really enjoy season three as as a whole, but this episode, I, I thought it was fine. I thought it was good. Um, I, I I don't find myself like thinking back on this episode when I think about Mad Men as a whole. Um, or even when I think about season three, um, I wouldn't even I wouldn't say that this is up in the, my ep- upper echelon of, of episodes. But it, it's good. It's entertaining. I really like the the Peggy bit with her at the bar, um, and just her being a little mini Don. Um, and uh, I really like uh, I, I like the the wedding date reveal that I'm sure we'll get into later. Um, that's just I think really smart writing, and for those people who know, you know. But uh, yeah, yeah it, it's it's a fine episode. I, I, I'm a bit different. This is a very memorable episode for me. It kind of hit me hard the first time I watched it. And, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's like the best, the best, 
but I think it's a pretty good episode. Uh, but what about you, Will? First time watching it. No excuses this time. Um, how, are you, how are you feeling about season three so far, especially with this episode? Um, well, I, it's too early for me to discuss uh, season three, but I do. I side. said so far. Jeez. Uh, I do side with um, Mike, I guess. I, I found this episode to be solid, but not exceptional. It does feel like a good bit of setup. Uh, especially with the the Betty Glenn stuff uh, for what's to come, I presume. Uh, I do, I still kind of disagree. I, there is setup, but I feel like the first episode was more setup than this. Hmm. This feels like a lot of the inciting incident stuff. Maybe I don't know. I just like with the Rogers stuff. It feels. I mean, obviously, like you said, there is a theme in the expiration of change or people's desire to want the change or inability to change. Um, but yeah, I just didn't really feel like it had like the oomph of some of the better Mad Men episodes I've seen. Episode starts with Bye Bye Birdie. It ends with kind of a a, a similar dance, you know, the dance around the Maypole, right? I mean, it technically it ends with uh, Peggy going into Don's office. But before that, we have like the celebration, the renewal of springtime. That first part of the episode is like you could even look at it as like a movie replacing a musical. Have either of you watched Bye Bye Birdie either of it in either format? My high school, I think either like my junior or senior year, Bye Bye Birdie was our spring musical. So mm-hmm. that is the only version of Bye Bye Birdie I've seen is a high school production of it. Um, Interesting. And it was grand. <laughs> it was a hoot and a half, if there ever was one. Uh, Will, have you, have you seen either form? I have not seen the film and I have not seen the stage show. How about you, Jonathan? I've, I have not seen the film either, uh, which is... You know, uh, a bit of a gap for me. I I really like the '60s, you know, musicals, especially with the It Girls, like uh, Anne Margaret, uh, who uh, this is before she did um, Carnal Knowledge. Yeah, and uh, she was she, you know, important to point out, she was a very, very uh, iconic person at the time. She was kind of uh, not supplanting Audrey Hepburn, but she was kind of like the new young person coming through. Remember, like it's been a couple years at this point, I think, since uh, Marilyn Monroe. Um, passed away, I think, just a year, actually. I was going to say, this is... And I mean, she's kind of more of a ingenue at this point. She's not quite the sex yes. symbol that people know her as in the years to follow. I, mean, I guess it kind of goes more she, to the This later. is the start of her... Well, this is the start of her sex appeal, because they had the whole conversation in the beginning of, like, clearly there is, like, a sex appeal, but it's rooted in her, like, in, you know, innocence. Yeah. And then that changes over the years into something more sultry and mature, right? right. Um... But yeah, I've heard Bye Bye Birdie is not a great film, but it's well liked among the people who enjoy this type of musical. I think that it's uh, one of my one of the interesting things about always rewatching this episode is how she's not a great singer. I don't think, you know, like she's singing that that first bit and it's very like choppy and awkward and it's a little messy, but it works. Right. I mean, you, you still feel it. Yeah, Don even mentions that, right? It's like the vulnerability of it. The fact that she's, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of breaking the fourth wall and and like expressing herself so emotionally and openly. I mean, that's like what people like, even if they don't love the the singing of it or that's, I guess, even what makes it more charming or more personable or whatever. And I would say that's happening in this episode. I noted. So I watched the episode twice, like usual, and I noticed both times there's a lot of like awkwardness and in baseball we call them errors right uh you know things that happen that (laughs) i'm trying to keep up with you you baseball nerds no but you know like in baseball where like somebody like doesn't catch something they were supposed to and it's like an error or whatever and it's like you know it, it just feels superfluous to the game because you know usually when you watch a tv show it's so polished like everything like everybody's just hitting everything so you have so much control but in this like don spills something you know peggy sings off key uh, there's a lot of like non sequiturs uh, the editing sometimes is a little out there and i, the I genuinely dinner. think the dinner the, the dinner being so awkward i think there's a lot of i think that's all purposeful i think that they left that stuff in or did that stuff on purpose to create that same vulnerability that opens with the show and what's cool about it is then it makes the smoother interactions more impressive like when don gives his uh, penn station madison square garden pitch it feels like more impactful because you're kind of like what's going to go wrong and then also i think it it kind of sells the theme of like this is why people kind of want to change things or in with the news like you get in a rut like you start to kind of when you're going through the motions and everything you sometimes you do need a like 
if you've been in like the same kind of phase for a while in your own life, sometimes you need to introduce like a little bit of like vigor or something to kind of like uproot or, you know, refresh your, your current daily routine. And I think that that's, uh, that's very astute, uh, for me coming through this episode. And sticking with your, your baseball metaphors, Peggy puts herself through a slump buster as well. <laughs> so she refreshes and renews herself. <laughs> Uh, the same way a ball player would. I don't. I don't know how I mean, familiar you, you are think, with the term slump buster, John. Do you, but it's a very do you specific. Think, well, well. Do you think um, that that uh, <clears throat> interaction was one in which she? It was a bit of a home run for her because the way she's getting out of there, I, I have a feeling that she didn't get to uh, uh, go all nine innings, if you will. Yeah. Well, I mean, because yeah, I well, think it's actually pretty clear because of uh, the lack of equipment that they uh, they had yeah, to. Yeah. Uh, you know, delay the game a bit and settle for uh, for a double, which she really wanted a home run. Yeah. yeah, she really wanted a bat, and instead she just got a ball. <laughs> I'll just say it: they went further than second base. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, I was setting that up. I was like, okay, we we have a clear. Um, anyway, Mikey did get hit by pitch, but mm, very nice, very nice. Um, yeah, so I guess I like this episode a bit more than you guys. Uh, but what, what are some things that stood out to you? We have a, a big Don plot here with uh, Grandpa Gene. Um, we have some Sterling Cooper drama with uh, new business, but mainly old business cycling out and some of that conflict between Lane and the uh, heads of Sterling Cooper. We have Paul being a beatnik. We have Peggy, as we've already mentioned, sort of going through like an interesting, like, you know, she hasn't really had a lot of like um sexual interactions with people um that have bit put her with like the most agency and this episode kind of explores that like her kind of like learning from joan again even um int- interesting like grouping of things in the roger stuff too uh i i like by the way that like you know Anne margaret roger's daughter is margaret but you know that's that might just be a happy accident uh but yeah what stuck out to you, you guys the most i, I want to hear from will um let's see i mean i think uh, the Peggy stuff, as uh, Mike mentioned, I think that's the stuff that, that resonated with me the most, especially since it feels like it's been a little bit since we've had Peggy on her own. Like the, a lot of the second season was her kind of exploring like her Catholic guilt and like her complicated relationship with uh, Father Colin Hanks and all these different things. It's nice to see like her femininity kind of gain the focus again as it was in the first season. And allowing, like you said, to, for her to get a little bit more agency and to explore her sexuality and her personality uh, in a way that, that felt refreshing. It, it was just nice to get that kind of stuff again. Yeah, there's, there's a line, uh, first scene, I think, when Harry's like, you're not fat anymore. And I've tried to tell you, Lash, and that Harry Crane is a, a punk and a big old jerk, meanie, bully even. And um, when he says that, I think that marks an interesting like point for her where she's like, all right, you know. She has sort of, it seems like she's sort of been trying to avoid what happened to her. Like she's being very particular about who she's with and how men treat her. And I think she's needed a lot of time to get over what happened, not even get over what happened, but like adapt to her life and like move on from what happened in in a meaningful way. And I think that's what season two was mainly about. Like you said, the Catholic guilt and her just trying to like hide it and suppress it. And now you kind of see her being like, all right, you know, some time has passed and I'm in this position where I'm still young and maybe I just kind of need to get out there and experiment a little bit, you know, and you know, try to get out of the office, you know, meet a guy at Brooklyn. Why not? Um, what, what do you think, Mike? Well, I think you see it just in the office too. It seems like at this point, maybe she's like overcorrecting for her season two kind of shyness where she's trying to take control of things, you know, in the office and outside of it. She is to Dawn, you know, uh, tells her to leave her tools in the toolbox because she's overthinking this whole bye bye birdie Pepsi deal. Um, she's taking control with a very vulnerable, growing boy, <laughs> uh, and so I think uh, he was it, eating that burger though. Oof. Well, he has to. His mom told him. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think I think it's really interesting to see Peggy. Yeah, again, she's overcorrecting, like really taking the reins and trying to take control of her life. Um, so I think we'll actually see some like fallacy from her some like hubris maybe even, but um, it's all part of growing, right? Like yeah. first you're stumbling and then you have strong legs and, but you don't know your own strength, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. I think it's key, right? That the guy that she kind of like, she goes after him, she sees him in the bar and she picks him, you know, it's kind of, I think 
interesting that she picks somebody who's a student. Um, she decides to try this with someone who, where there is a bit of an imbalance there and she's okay with him not knowing that there is because she's a professional woman. She's not just a typist. Like he mistakes her. Uh, she is like probably older. Uh, I, I want to say she's like 20, three maybe at this point i could be wrong and he's more like a student like he looks like he's maybe 21 right um but of course like there's like a gap there in terms of like maturity and that's why i think she doesn't have a real connection with a guy like they're just not like on the same like level in terms of like life experience but i think yeah it's interesting that she chooses him to sort of like go for that and try to be something a, a little bit different. Uh, and again, like I was saying before, in terms of like, there are so many like weird interactions and it's not very polished. Like they can't even hear each other, like talking in the bar. It's like little things like that, that really made the episode for me at least. Um, and she seems, anything else in the Peggy stuff? Will? Oh, well, yeah. I was say, I mean, it seems like her attraction kind of blooms from the fact that she sees something of herself in the guy and the fact that he's kind of put down upon, seen as lesser than, but clearly has these virtues that seem to kind of be coming out more when she talks to him a little bit and allows him to get out of his shell a little bit. So it seems like that's kind of feeding it too. But I, I do think there is something to be said about like, she can kind of uh, control a relationship in a way that she hasn't really been able to control any real relationship either at work or at home uh, in the first she two seasons. She kind of did in the second, like the first or second episode of the second season, she was like making out with that guy in the hallway. Right. And then she puts him down and like, that's, I think one of the last times we see her kind of like pursuing somebody. And then I think that's the point of like, she's just not there yet. Yeah. And then in this episode, we're kind of seeing her take that a bit further, right? Yeah. But I was also going to say, I mean, I do think we are in this episode still seeing some of the ramifications of Dawn's absence. Uh, and I think with Peggy, it seems like she's still trying to kind of like assert herself in the way that she did when Don was gone. And it seems like she's not really able to really find that, especially when she has that interaction with Don. But also kind of see that with like Harry. Also, it seems like the other people are kind of trying to assert themselves. Like Pete's still trying to be like, you know, the level headed, like controlled guy. Harry's being more liberated and outspoken. There's clearly some difficulty still with uh, Don and Roger. Like, seems like they're. Uh, relationships yeah. a little bit more tumultuous and it seems like don's still trying to control his home life so like outside of the the conversation you mentioned with uh the guy from madison square garden it seems like he's a little distant and like you know kind of aloof like he doesn't really want to work and he's just um you know just and, and it's even kind of like he's unpolished like there's like that one scene where like he misses the ashtray and it's like yeah you know, that was like, the one i was referencing yeah, earlier yeah. right yeah, yeah i think that's the point yeah no i think you're spot on and no, i think it's like he's in a funk He's kind of like, I think that's why at the end of the episode, he is like touching the grass. You know, he literally touches grass in this, in this episode, but like you kind of see him sort of like letting himself like uh, this could, I he, wanting to like maybe start a phase. Like it, it's kind of, um, it reminds me of how in advertising you go from like client to client. I think sometimes this show is sort of like treating that, like how Don treats affairs, it's like he can't just be married to one. He could never work for an in-house agency. He kind of has to always have like all these different things, all these different like pies in the air, <clears throat> but he doesn't like treat them all equally. He doesn't always give his undue time to all of them. You see that with the patio stuff. Pampers gets brought up at the end. And uh, I, I do want to talk about the patio stuff a little bit more. So patio, that is uh, what Diet Pepsi was called before. And uh, I love the line where, where Don is like, yeah, every woman wants to drink a beverage that is named after a floor <laughs> or named after the floor. Um, yeah, the patio thing. W what's your take on the advertising creativity around that? That's the idea of like the knockoff and like Peggy's instinct is, you know, like it's, it's bad and she's kind of pushing back against it. Uh, have you had these experiences before, Mike? Well, I was actually thinking, uh, I, I was thinking about what they're trying to do to advertise a, a, a soda and what we see like now, like I'll, I thought about the, the stupid like Kendall Jenner saving the world with a Pepsi can kind of idea, right? Where it's, it's not the exact same thing, but it's like, I don't know, uh, a hot woman just with the new drink and she likes it and she's sharing it with people. And it's like, is that, I guess it's what they were trying to do back then is what they're still trying to do now. And you know, people see it and they want to make you want to drink Pepsi. I don't know. I don't know either. Uh, you remember the Joy of Cola campaign from the the nineties where they had that uh, little girl and she's like, uh, "Oh, I want a Pepsi," and he gives her Coke, and then she's like, uh, she starts talking like a mob boss. She's like, 
you, you give me this Coca Cola when I ask for for Pepsi, you know, and then like everyone in the restaurant is like scared. So those are those are my favorite Pepsi commercials, probably. Bada bing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think at one point, like somebody like th- makes like a sound, and everyone thinks like everyone's getting shot. <laughs> um, um. Uh, I, I know for me, I'm I'm more of a Coca Cola guy, uh, but I do like. There's a theater in uh in, in the Bay Area. That has Pepsi products, and I do appreciate that because sometimes I, you know, I like to go for a Pepsi. Sometimes I, I like to switch it up. I like change here sure. and there. Um, I will say that uh, as in regards to Pepsi at the theater where I work, um, uh, not really by our choice, we had to switch to Pepsi products. And initially, I was really annoyed by it, but I've been getting into okay. Pepsi Wild Cherry. Uh, okay, and, uh, so I, I will recommend uh, of the Pepsi, and also obviously Mountain Dew, which is probably my favorite pop was. Uh, is a Pepsi That's product. That's the thing. Yeah, exactly. I never liked Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew slaps at a movie, man, and that is why I'm, I'm happy my my local theater is a Pepsi. You guys, Pepsi. you guys can yeah help yourselves. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll I'll stick to something else instead of Mountain Dew. Uh, Mike, are you Pepsi or Coke? What are we talking about? Um, I like both. Um, I I, re- I generally generally don't care. I probably lean more towards Coke, like just because it seems to be more prevalent. Like if I go out, I'll drink a, a rum and Coke or a whiskey Coke, something like that. Got it. Got it. The other thing I'm is sorry, that was uh, very important for us. Um, at our theater. I don't know if you guys know, but Sierra miss is no longer around as of January of this year. Yeah, they have the uh, story. Story. It's now yeah, story, yeah. but we still have Sierra mist uh, at the theater. So, I was able to sure, do those like boxes a, aren't going to expire overnight. So. Uh, we were able to do like a taste test and compare the two. Um, they're very, as you would expect, they're very similar, but like, oh. um, Sierra Mist, I think has more of a like, uh, pleasant, like kind of aftertaste. Like it just, it seems like Starry is really trying to go out of its way to be Sprite 2.0. And I think that might lead to its downfall. Uh, but that's my review of Starry. It looks too much like Sprite. At least Sierra Mist had like at least a somewhat different identity to it, but Starry just looks like I could grab it by mistake. And maybe that's the idea. Yeah. I'm also um, sympathetic to Sierra Mist because they would have at, like theme parks, those little like miss sections. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. What are they going to do now? Right. Well, they do, they do have like the Coke zones, you know, where they do the same thing and like no one cares. They're just like, oh yeah, cold mist. Give it. Mm-hmm. But in any case, um, I was going to say, as far as the uh, the ad is concerned, it does kind of mirror in some respects, I feel like, what Don's going through, where it's like, it's it's intentionally very derivative. Like, it's just, it's not even an idea. It's just like, hey, we like this thing. Do for us. With yeah, this. there's no idea behind it. Right. <laughs> it's just like, it, lo- it just seems nice. Right. And it's even, which is not it, good. <laughs> and uh, Betty's like the only one that seems like annoyed on the, the company's behalf. That's like uh, phony. It's like not... You know, like they they strive for some sort of authenticity or something that's based in reality, and this is just totally you know a full on fantasy. Which, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it kind of seems like that might be mirroring what's going on with the uh, you know, like like Dawn is trying to make things work with uh, Betty and the, and renew their marriage and sort of their relationship. But is that kind of just a farce at this point? Like, are they just kind of deluding themselves? Are they also sort of deluding themselves with the idea that? you know, taking in another child, both with, uh, you know, the baby to be born, also like looking after Gene, is that going to like stabilize them or is that only going to make things more strenuous? Well, I, on that, I think there's a lot of like this theme of short sightedness in this, in this episode from Don, not thinking things through and just wanting to win Betty over and ha- have the dad thing happen. Um, when, when uh, Price is asked why they bought Sterling Cooper and he says, I don't know. Um, to what was the other one? Even Don Don's pitch on Madison Square Garden, I think, really centers on short sightedness, or then them not wanting to pursue Madison Square Garden. Yeah, that was that's a big one, right? Because Don says it outright, where he's like, "This could lead to way more business," you know, and it's like in two years, and yeah, thirty years of business. He says yep. that they're losing because of this. But um, yeah, I am. Um, <clears throat> okay, I was just gonna say it. Also, is like another thing with the episodes dealing with like traditionalism versus change. And how like they can kind of infuse the two, like in a sense, um, you know, like the fact that Madison Square Garden is going to replace Penn Avenue is a sense of change against traditionalism. But in that respect, it's bad. Like it's going against 
what's probably best for the city and best for the the interest of its history. And the same is potentially maybe true with Don and Betty, like trying to strive for this sort of traditional marriage again. Like they're trying to renew themselves, but it seems like Don still has California at heart. And especially when he's like rubbing the grass and, and kind of thinking about sunny pastures, uh, the new grass yeah. right, growing from the springtime. But also that's in a way, even though that would be changed, it's also traditionalism for Don. Cause I'd be going back to his old ways of just, that's why it's like, it's a renewal. It's not total change. Like there's nothing completely new under the sun. Um, I think that's why part of why this episode is called love among the ruins. It's also based on a poem called love among the rooms by, uh, Robert Browning. But it, the idea is that like what's new is or what's old is new and what's new is old. And I think even that, that goes back to one of my favorite things about this show. I know we've talked about it is how these characters feel like real people because we're constantly learning about them. They're constantly surprising us. I think that a lot of people, like for me, when I first watched this episode, I didn't see it coming that Don was going to have like work it out with William or not work it out, bully William <laughs> into having Gene stay with them. That was a surprise to me because I was like, Don it seems so counter to what Don would do, but that's why the show is what it is. Right. And, um, what he says to Peggy, I think Peggy is surprised that he doesn't see things her way with patio because it's the line that he says that I think really, really drives home what kind of person he is. He says to her, and I think he's also saying this about himself. You're not an artist. You solve problems. Don doesn't see himself as an artist. He uses art, right? I think that we see it a lot in season one, his relationship with Midge and, you know, his, how he watches movies all the time. Lately, he hasn't been watching movies as we see, because like Peggy is like, really? You watch everything. But he's been so preoccupied with Betty's pregnancy and now all this gene stuff that he's not going to movies as much. And also Sterling Cooper is in a very precarious situation. He can't just, you know, blitz off for the afternoon to go watch a movie anymore. And it's impacting his creativity. But, you know, part of him is like, well, it's not really his job. It's kind of like how, you know, when he does use art or he he turns up that poetry, it's to win a pitch, you know, it's to, to win over the, the Penn Station guy, the Madison Square Garden guy. But I think that it, it's kind of like that old Disney quote, right? I think like, was it Walt Disney who said this? Or it might have been like Michael Eisner or like one of the heads of Disney at one point kind of said, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but this idea of like, we have to make good movies. Like we have to make good art because that's what's going to make us money. Ultimately, Disney exists to make money. And the reason that there's art involved in it is because that's what leads to money. But when you're in a situation where what leads to money is not art, and in this case, the patio thing, just going along with what they want so they win the client, Don doesn't care. He's like, yeah, I, I, it's not his priority. And so that, to me, is one of the biggest takeaways from this episode in terms of the Don Draper character. That's my rant. And surely Disney will follow that great tradition with their upcoming <laughs> film, The Little Mermaid 2023. <laughs> that's exactly i see that on tuesday and i uh am not looking forward to it i'll tell you that much all right um a lot of stuff with don in this episode do we want to talk about the grandpa gene of it all william and the kids coming over and i, I kind of wanted to get y'all's read uh first of all i feel so bad for judy um william's wife like she's so nice <laughs> And she seems like genuine and like Betty just shits on her relentlessly. And like William shits on her. Jean shits on her. Don's probably like, I'd sleep with her. But like, otherwise he just, he's indifferent to her. Uh, I just want to say justice for Judy. And she also seems like the only one who genuinely like is concerned with what's actually best for Jean. Mm-hmm. Like w- would take care of them once they give them a good life where everybody else has their own motivations. Involved. She's a sweetheart. She is a sweetheart. What's she doing with William? William, he doesn't even seem like that terrible of a person. He just seems like, you know, just kind of like a mediocre guy who he, he's probably nice enough, you know, day to day, but like clearly has some like issues because he's a Hofstadt. And like, I don't know how you don't have issues with based on the information we have about that family. But uh, yeah, I mean, I was a little sympathetic to William, I suppose. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I want to hear a, it. Uh, you know, he he talks about how he's thirty. He is like not quite sure what he wants out of life. He feels kind of mitigated. I'm like, you know, yeah, I can I can see where he's coming from. I he's I love a, he's a bit of a Pete Campbell in some ways. I love the imagery. Um, you know, I think it was in the inheritance where like there was like 
you know, like he's sort of always like this kind of child at heart, I guess, kind of like you said, similar to Pete Campbell and like in that Sleeping one. Sleeping in a bunk bed. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was going to say, well, in, in the inheritance, <laughs> he like comes out of like the tree house or whatever. He goes into the window and he's like, you yeah, know, yeah. a kid coming home. Uh, and this one, yeah, he's like him and Judy are in the bunk bed <laughs> and they're talking about like, I'm an yeah. adult. I'm a man. I should do something. But it's that great long Dude, shot it's just, like i'm a 30 year old man right <laughs> it's like showing a bunk bed in right. full frame yeah. yeah yeah so i thought that was i thought that was great i do like the pete campbell comp john because that's why i think about him i think he's like this like we make multiverse jokes but like just pete campbell on the other end of the spectrum like if a couple of things went differently in pete's life he'd be in the same position do you think that's why he married someone named Judy and like Pete married someone named Trudy and his sister-in-law is also named Judy? <laughs> Lots of Udi. Yes, yeah. I do. I, I think Weiner was always holding out for this big multiverse thing to pop off so he could come <laughs> back with Mad Men world. I wonder, I wonder how Will will react when the Judys meet each other for the first time and then they accidentally, you know, create WandaVision or something. Um, when they freaky Friday. Oh no, and they- I spoiled it. Ah, damn it, John. Sorry. Uh, Will, are you ready for, for Gene to be in the show? I mean, Gene's been in the show, but you, you but mean... He's, for- he's in the Draper household. Yeah. You better buckle up, Will Ashton. It looks like he's here to stay. He's going to come around. He's going to be here. I mean, I would like to say I'm excited in the sense that it would be fun, but it seems like it's just going to be depressing and pretty sad to watch a Do man... Do you know why with- he was uh, dumping the alcohol? Because of the prohibition? He had yeah. like a, a war memory and stuff. Yeah. Not a war memory. No, sorry, yeah, no, sorry, yeah. Not a war, a, a, prohibition. A, a flashback or, or whatever, like a, yeah, sorry. That's what I meant. Um, yeah, it, I, I, I as much as it, it he's a character I, I'm intrigued by, it seems like these scenes with him coming up are just going to be pretty depressing to watch. I do like those scene that scene though, where Don seems to genuinely make him laugh when he's like, you're an army man. She, <laughs> you know, in fact, I think that's part of the, the trivia I have. So we'll get to that actually yeah. in terms of like what that means. Um, I think it's interesting that like, so Paul is like, he kind of lashes out at the guy. And every time I see this, I'm like, how, how is it that Paul doesn't get like really much of a consequence from this? Like Don is just kind of like, yeah, you got to keep a low profile, but you have to work. And I have a new theory for this on like why Don doesn't chew him out or anything. And I think it's because... I think Sterling Cooper is in such a weird state right now that he just can't afford all that conflict. He has enough conflict with Lane and their British overseers that he's just like, whatever, you know, it's kind of like with the patio thing too. He's just not looking for a fight. He just kind of wants to uh, move on and again, solve problems. But again, I I still find it kind of a weird moment in the episode. I I don't know if you guys agree. I like the follow up. Well, I don't, I I don't like it, but I like the scene of how just naive he is when at the end of it, he's like, now they'll trust me more. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I almost had that with, uh, when, when Pete Campbell's like, do you ever listen to yourself? I was going to be like, Will Ashton, do you ever listen to yourself? <laughs> but um, you're, you're exactly right. You know, it's like, there's way too many things going on. Like this doesn't matter because it's a problem that Don can solve. I think it'd be a bigger issue if it's a problem he couldn't solve. Uh, but also it's, I think not just a problem he doesn't want to deal with, but also well, what's the consequence? He, he, he fires him. What's going to happen? The home office is going to hire another one of their guys, which means there's yeah. less Sterling Cooper people. Like, I think there's a bit of territory battle still happening. I think we'll pay close attention to how Don is, I mean, you already are, because you already talked about like the way Don is reacting to Sterling Cooper being bought and the consequences of last season, him not being there. Um, I, I think that it's very purposeful too that California gets brought up here and Don is trying to leverage that into an advantage. But yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, he has that whole thing with Lane where he's like, why did you buy us? And you, you're starting to see like, maybe he was like slightly like, it's, it's not that he was indifferent to them getting bought, but you could see him be a little wary. I think he, this is us watching him in real time, see why this was a bad idea and why uh, Roger or not Roger, Burt Cooper was a bit, you know, wary about it and, and kind of succumb to it because of the pressure. And, you know, if it, it does make you think like if Don had been around, do you think he could have talked Roger out of this? Because now they're in just such a, tricky situation where they're losing accounts and they don't have the manpower and it's just yeah it's it's not great for for sterling cooper at the moment doesn't seem yeah i I also just briefly wanted to mention burt cooper has a great line when like they all go into lane's office and it's like we lost 
whatever account that was, like, this is an ad agency. <laughs> if if I have to be informed every time we lose a client, I'll wear out the carpet. Yeah, that's a great line. <laughs> Love it. I, w- I did have a version of it where it's like, I'll wear out the podcast, but I, I couldn't make it work. So uh, sorry to deprive you too. Um, well, you didn't because you still just said it, John. So <laughs> that's, that's actually, <laughs> well, I know that you like, you like me setting the tone at the beginning of the episodes, right? You always text yeah. me that after the fact. I mean, you act like sure. you don't love it, but um, I think Sterling Cooper, yeah. much like the Madison square garden Penn station thing though, is uh, similar, right? Because the interesting thing about Madison square garden replacing Penn station is that Penn Station's still there, right? It's underneath yes. Madison square garden. Like it still exists, just it there's there's something new and it looks different on the surface. Yeah, there's and like an exactly, old New York City under the current New York City. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Uh, and uh, that's what's happening at Sterling Cooper, right? Uh, from the outset on the surface, it, it's different. They're owned by this British company, but there's still the bones of what it was, and there's people fighting about what it should be, right? That's a great point, Mike. Really, really smart. Um, let's see here. Oh yeah, I really like that line. I know I I kind of was joking with it earlier, but like where, where Don is like, let's also say that change is neither good or bad; it simply is. Uh, do you guys agree with that? Like that that feels like you know. Do you think he's just pitching that, or do you think like maybe the show is saying something different? Like not just your personal opinions, but you know, do you think that like change can be this neutral, or do you think I I personally wonder, you know, if it's more of like some it can be both, it could be neither. Like, what what do you think? I. Uh... I, I personally am not one that's very resistant to change. I think my life has changed a lot in the, even just the last six years. Um, and I also think Don is someone who's very okay with change. I think he is someone who will roll with what life hands him and make like the most of a situation, right? Until he doesn't and he like runs away. But even then that, right, is, I guess, change in it, in it within itself. So um, I think Don deals with a deck that's handed to him and he truly believes that nothing will ultimately matters which is why change is yeah i mean i think there is something interesting about don versus roger in this episode in the sense that i think roger is someone who wants to be capable of change but simply is unable to and we kind of see that in that pitch meeting where like he's you know like in this position where he needs to kind of uh win over the client but he's doing like kind of uh um morose jokes and he just kind of like gives up pretty early and he's you know also dealing with a lot of similar issues that don's dealing with um in this episode but like in his response like he's kind of caught between wanting to be in this new marriage kind of get out of uh the slump he's in but he's still trying to assume this sort of traditional role in his daughter's life where he's like you know he's paying for the wedding he wants to have uh, you know, like a, a say in what happens, like he wants to be there for his daughter, but they're kind of shutting him out outside of like a few financial and, uh, you know, like traditional decisions, like with the, the wedding card, uh, ideas yeah. and stuff like that. And I think it is interesting that unless I forget Jane wasn't in the first episode of the season, right? She was not. No, I was gonna say, we haven't I, seen her yet in season three. That's why I think it's interesting that Jane is becoming kind of more of a, like a concept now as opposed to like a character like he's something that roger seems to be striving for but like as he's becoming or trying to become this other person like jane becomes less and less a person in the picture and i i just think that's really interesting as a first time viewer he's it's the same thing with greg right so so joan and roger got married in between these seasons and, you know, you even have that icy interaction with them where he's like Mrs. Harris, you know, and then clearly Joan and him just are not on <laughs> a good level at the moment. But then also he has that interaction to what you're saying with Peggy, which is heartbreak, you know, and, and he's like putting Peggy into his business. And look, I love Peggy and Roger interactions because they don't happen often, <laughs> but when they do, they always just feel really like, yeah, it's just like put these two in an elevator and just see what happens with these characters and it's always interesting and with him you know being like you know what, you know your father you know what happened if your father didn't go to your wedding and she's like my my father passed away and then and he's just like there it is like instead of being like sympathetic being like, oh i'm sorry you know anything like having like that shred of decency he's just like oh you would do anything and like that is just you see it on a peggy and peggy is like so forlorn that she has to like go get laid to like deal with the stress of it uh, right after the scene but not before she does a little uh musical number for herself and for us no that's that's earlier in the episode 
Was it? No, so I thought it was... watched... No, she has a thing with Roger, and then it the next scene is oh. her in Brooklyn. Okay, yeah, you're right. Yeah, she goes to the bar. Sorry, which I by the way, watched this episode, but that she bar, does. it's cool. It's fine. That bar, it looks really fun. I would love to go to that bar. It just looked like a good time. It looked like something straight from the movies. I mean, it's straight from a TV show. But I mean, that's the same bar that they've gone to before, right? Like that's where. Uh, when? I don't think so. It's in Brooklyn. Yeah, I think that's more of a place by by Peggy. Where when you think of the bar that they're going out to, they're going to be in Manhattan. I thought the one it where they be a did... similar set to the one where they did the twist. That's in what the I thought. First yeah. Season. yeah, I thought it was that same bar, but is it it's not? not the same bar? No, because that bar was in Manhattan. Just canonically, they could be using the same set for all we know. But yeah, it also looks like a little bit more cramped. But maybe that's because there's so many people, right? But I mean, the point is, Peggy went out there. She was she used Jones crowded in a subway line, um, which is very cute. And uh, I, I got to call out that guy had some, he had some nice wingmen, you know, they, they, they knew what they were doing. They, they were kind of, you know, that, that whole thing like, Hey, you got cab fare. Oh yeah, that's right. You live close by. Uh. <laughs> Smooth. Smooth. Very cool. Um, that's everything I had in my notes. Uh, was there anything else you guys wanted to, to talk about? Oh, I did have one more thing. When Harry Crane is like, you're not fat anymore. And he's such a jerk and bully. We all wanted to punch him in that moment, obviously. But then Sal, Sal looks like he kind of gives Harry a look and then Peggy look that's sort of like, hey, that's my friend you're talking about. Peggy and I are, are solid at the moment. And I do think it's a continuing this silent arc of like Sal genuinely likes Peggy <laughs> and, and like respects her and is like doesn't like all the shit that she has to pull, put up with. But I mean, he's not that good of a friend where he's just going to be like, hey, cut that out. It's Sal, you know, he goes along to get along. But I just want to say my boy Sal is a good guy. Yeah, I always vouch for counts. Sal. I felt, you know, for him when he wanted to keep watching Bye Bye Birdie and they shut it off. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. She's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and when she's just like, oh, yeah, because she's 25 acting like she's 14. He's like, is that what that is? <laughs> Great stuff. Like, Great stuff. Um, all right. Um, oh, yeah. I had another note. Um, Don and Betty at one point are asked how long they've been married. Uh, Betty says nine. Don says 10. Uh, why do you think they uh didn't have that right or were not in sync on that i mean besides the obvious like read of like oh yeah don and betty are never in sync uh but why do you think one of them thought one year or the other pregnancy i mean i was in a, i was gonna say between the pregnancy and the the estrangement of them the last year yeah, don yeah. maybe lost track of time in two years became go. one yeah, to that's, him that's a good point yeah that's maybe their I anniversary thought. happened while yeah. they were mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i like that read a lot um I don't have, yeah, I think that really is it for me. Um, except I did, you know, it's always frustrating to see like, uh, you know, Betty smoking and drinking while pregnant. We saw with Francine in the first season and the show is still kind of, you know, getting that across, but I think it she's is drinking nice. Too. She's drinking, uh, she's smoking a cigarette. And I do think that like one remarkable improvement you see from season one to season three, as at this point, they really aren't playing up the like, look, it's the sixties stuff as much as they were, or at least it's not as on the nose and in, in the way of the rest of the show it's there, but I think it's way more subtle and realistic, um, which is why I think it's more effective. I mean, I also think, uh, kind of going back to an earlier point, uh, this is one of the few episodes where Betty is actually in the office, uh, oh, yeah. know, kind of tying the whole idea of Don being more, preoccupied with his home life and his work life that even his home life is coming into the work life. But I appreciate oh, that's it. Right. We didn't see his uh, secretary in the first episode, Will. So you got to see his new secretary oh, yeah. out with the old and with the new secretary. There you go. Do you, you, do you recognize that, uh, that character? Uh, I can't say that I do not off the top of She's my head. She's been in the show for two seasons. Okay. Yeah. She was the receptionist uh, at Sterling Cooper. Oh, um, okay, season one okay. and season two. She's gotcha. that, that racist lady who gets really like, Oh, you know, that's mean right. When yeah. Paul's uh, girlfriend, Sheila comes and that's right. she's just like, Oh, you're kiss. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. She's now Don's secretary. How about that? Um, Allison. I appreciated Joan like that. referencing, uh, Wilma Flintstone. Cause it's about <laughs> damn time. You know, the <laughs> Mad Men reference the Flintstones it's you know yeah there you go one of the most popular shows of the the time they don't even acknowledge it you know about time. Yeah, yeah what about you Mike uh I did uh I, I think I want to talk a little bit about the dinner they had with the prices I thought that was kind of brief but interesting Ooh. because yeah like if you think about it like as far as like antagonists 
like pseudo antagonists. I wouldn't exactly call them antagonists, but pseudo antagonists of the show. Uh, like Duck last season came over for dinner. It was a fine time, right? Like they were at least able to to get along and talk about regular things. But man, they, they nothing. There's nothing going at that dinner. Yeah, um, it's it's tense. You know, I think it's a it's mirroring the tension between Sterling Cooper and why uh, Putnam Powell and Lowe. Um, seeing the tension between him and Lane and like how frustrated everybody is about the situation. Neither of us want to be there. <laughs> you know, and that culminates with the like, why'd you buy us? It's like, they're kind of stuck in each other's lives at this point. And, and I feel bad because I'm like, well, I wouldn't be sad about Jared Harris being stuck in my life. I consider it a blessing. Yeah. Also a really interesting line of like comparing, uh, the, the British sentiments of, of the time when she talks about living close yeah. to the UNs and Africans and, insects and all these things yeah she's like she's basically like being passive aggressive about how much she hates new york and like it makes lane uncomfortable <laughs> you know it's almost just like she's representing his bosses and lane is kind of this weird mediator where he's trying to make the best of it try not to focus on the negatives and then you have don who's just kind of like you know don and betty who are like jesus can can we like have a you know fake conversation at least that's like not this heated <laughs> it's weird yeah and then yeah where she's like ah Thank God, the coquettes or whatever they were, the cookies, uh, the, yeah, whatever that was. But yeah, awkward, tough situation. Ambeth Davids is the the actress who plays Price's wife, and uh, yeah, the Price's wife. Also, just one other thing: the foreshadowing of Margaret's wedding when it drops the invitation and we see the date. I was going to bring that up in trivia at least, but we can, yeah. Uh, yeah Will, no, we can. We, we can go the, to trivia. Do you know the significance oh, of that of date? Well, Ash, yeah, that's of course, the, yeah. the day JFK got assassinated. No, I know well, that. the day after. Sorry. The, okay. I was going to say, because I know 11-22-63 as uh, Mike's name is uh, the Stephen King book. Well, he has 11-23-63. I know, I know. Close. Is, yes, yes. But um, Let's say Stephen King for some reason. I thought that was Phil K. Dick. Yeah. Nope. Okay. It, sorry that. But the, the wedding invitation is the 23rd, right? Yes. Yeah, it's yes. the day after the assassination. I was going to say the day Which after. Which is these. arguably worse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. It would be like getting married on september 12th 2001 exactly which happened to yeah. people like they oh, got, sure, well yeah. i mean i don't know how many people got married on a wednesday but you know sure all right well i think that's it for us then um yeah i mean we have that dramatic tension um actually we'll ask you make a prediction uh where in the season do you think the jfk assassination is going to happen do you think it's going to be in a few episodes do you think it's going to be at the end of the season what do you think um i would guess like mid-season Okay, so we'll we'll put that down in the books. We'll guess it's mid season. Um, well, can 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 I just say, think think about the election, Will? Sure. How Madman treated that, and how Mike, big Nixon is. I mean, I could very easily that. see it being towards the end of the season, to be sure. Mike, be kind. Um, I just, oh, and also, of context clears. I don't know. That's Abigail Spencer, um, who we see as Sally's teacher, uh, the one that Don kind of looks at, and it's just like she looks like my mother too. Um, is she how, from, she ima- how he imagines his mother. Is she from something? She looked familiar, but I didn't. I could. Yeah, she was in a uh, network series, uh, not Homeland, but one of the, one of the ones like that. Let well, Homeland is not a network show. <laughs> it's Showtime. I know, I know. Um, she was on uh, All My Children, um, and She's then she suits. was on Suits. Yes, she was on Suits as a, she was like a main love interest, I think, for the the main guy. I forget his name. Uh, she was also on Hawthorne, and she was on a Lifetime series. Yeah, she's been all over TV. I um, can't say I've seen any of those shows, except for maybe a few clips and passing of Suits. Because Suits sister, is the, the main one, and my, then, of course, this oh, show. Wow. Yeah, she's also kind of a big part of Grey's Anatomy for a little bit. Oh, yeah. I did, I, she has a recurring role. I, I uh, genuinely she's like it. way she passionate when I was watching Grey's Anatomy. Owen Hunt's sister. But anyways. Okay. Wait, you were watching Grey's Anatomy, John? Uh, back when it was like coming out, I would watch it with my mom. Like, second season. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I am up to date. I know. Buddy. All episodes. You're, right? you're of, the guy we got to go to, you know? Uh, is it? Are you watching it because of your, uh, you know, significant other? Or are you just watching it on your own, keeping up? No, I would, I, I would, I, my Grey's Anatomy journey has spanned the course of multiple partners. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And, uh, it's just, it's been a common denominator and it's great because I don't have to rewatch shit. I just pick up and continue with whoever I'm with now, you know? Wow. And if for some reason me and Hannah don't make it, I'm sure my next girlfriend 
So you know, it's, we'll we'll be in season twenty together. Lo- it's your love of this show among the ruins of your relationships. Is it exactly. one of those things where all your partners have just been watching it, and you're like, "Oh, I'll just keep watching" because they watch it? Or would you insist yeah. upon your partner? Like if Hannah hadn't watched Grey's Anatomy, no. you'd be like, "Oh, you they're, gotta- they're wa- I respect that a lot. I date white women from the suburbs. Will they're all watching it? Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. All right, <laughs> let's uh, let's go to trivia here. Um, okay, so the Robert Browning poem I mentioned uh, that is called Love Among the Ruins. Uh, this is the poem itself, in case people were curious. Uh, Lust of glory pricked their hearts up, dread of shame struck them tame, and that glory and that shame alike, the gold bought and sold. I don't know what it means, but it sounds pretty. Um, I already had this, of course, that uh, the wedding invitation, November 23rd, 1963, we already covered that, day after JFK was assassinated. Uh, we already brought up the... Uh, the thing with like why he's like tossing out the alcohol and I see that here too, but yeah, prohibition heat, you know, police. Um, so at the point where, and I'm just on the IMDB trivia, so I'm just kind of going off of this. Uh, so when we see him, when Don says to Gene, uh, you're an, you're an army man, Gene, drop your socks and grab something. Um, Don made this joke based on an age old military ritual in which sergeants would wake up their sleeping soldiers in the morning by yelling, drop your cocks and grab your socks. <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, I'm reading this for the first time. Uh, there is, oh yeah. So uh, when Rogers with the executive, and uh, they're talking about, um, you know, the, what Paul did uh, with the Penn Station thing, he says uh, he took a Yetta Walenda sized misstep. Uh, so he's referencing something. He kind of mentions what happened to her to the tightrope girl. Uh, Yetta was a member of the famous Walenda family of trapeze and high wire artists known as the Flying Walenda, several of whom met gruesome deaths from falls during their acts. In April 1963, Yetta Walenda was performing in Omaha, Nebraska, according to Time magazine. She apparently fainted at the climax of her solo act atop a swing fiberglass pole, fell gracefully and silently 50 feet to the ground. She was 42. Um, I do wonder, you know, reading that, I, I wonder if maybe like Robin from Batman might be based on that a little bit. Um, I'm just guessing. Cause I don't remember when Robin came around in the Batman comics. Might have been before this. So I could be way off, but um, just putting that out there as a possibility. I don't know. Um, oh yeah, this is this is me because I, I I looked this up, but I don't I don't think I see it here. But the, do you guys know the what the drink is that Peggy um, the Stinger? Do you know what the, what's in that? Nope. She says it's delicious. Uh, and I think it's interesting that they picked this drink. So this drink is a duo cocktail. It's creme de menthe mixed with brandy, which I think it's interesting that like Peggy drinks this and like she has her like, you know, menage a trois, uh, or I guess it's not really, it's two of them, but um, she has her like her indiscretion and she doesn't seem not, she's not like sloshed, which I, I guess I find it kind of interesting. It's like Peggy is kind of like, there's that whole line in the first season where, you know, you're a writer, depending on how much like alcohol you consume. And I think there's something to be said about like, uh, Peggy's alcohol tolerance at this point, because, uh, yeah, that's not a, it's not a light drink. Creme de menthe kind of makes you go for it, but I guess she did go for it. If you want to put that there. Um, yeah, go ahead. Robin, Robin debuted in 1940 in the comics. Okay. Yeah, it's a bad guess on my part. I, I just had a few, I don't know. I, I, when I think of like sidekicks entering like the Silver Age of like comics, I think of the 60s, but yeah, it's a bit off. John saw um, maybe that do we know that's when of Robin's, Robin. Well, yeah, do we know that's like when Robin's backstory came around? I don't know about that. Um, well, Dick Grayson debuted in 1940, but he was, yeah. you know, he was a detective. So, yeah, I don't know comics well enough to know like when his backstory with the trapeze artist came around. Um, it it, it could have been around that time. I mean, it's not like. That was the first time a trapeze artist, you know, anyway, John Harry um, hears about the death of a woman, uh, from a tragic accident. You're like, Oh, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, Ryan Coogler talked about Batman, by the way, I got to tell you guys about that. Um, he had a very like, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, Ryan Coogler talked about Batman. Anyway, William, okay. um, Betty's brother, uh, suggested that their father be admitted to the Parker House, uh, halfway between us and New Brunswick. After his recent strokes memory loss, the Parker House was a nursing facility since 1907 and well-known and respected in the area of central New Jersey. A fun little detail there. Um, and also, uh, I didn't know this. So not only is Anne Margaret like kind of like a, a, a name that kind of connects to Roger's daughter, we do have that Roger and Peggy interaction. And uh, it lo- uh, Anne Margaret, her birth name is Anne Margaret Olson. So that's close to Peggy's name. So I, that's that's a kind of, that's a really cool connection too. I wonder if that was like the idea when Weiner was like naming these characters in the first season. If he wanted, if he had this in his mind at one point. Who knows? 
Um, let's see here. I think that might be it. I have one. Go ahead. So uh, we all know that Madison Square Garden gets built. We're talking about it. But this is actually the third version of Madison Square Garden. No kidding. Uh, there, have been, there have been two more prior to this. Uh, the first one was owned by, guess who, John? Speaking of trapeze artists. Oh, gosh. P.T. Barnum? P.T. Barnum, yeah, was the first owner of the first Madison Square Garden. The greatest showman. <laughs> the greatest um, showman. Oh, wait, I, I, did, I did lie. Uh, there's one more. Um, the song that's playing at the end of the episode during the Maypole dance, um, it's a song that you hear often in the show SpongeBob SquarePants. Do you know why? It's a royalty-free song. <laughs> I was just about and, to say uh, yeah, I was licensing free. Yes, the, yeah. the early the early seasons of SpongeBob, especially the first season, used a lot of like license free music. You know, um, a lot of the iconic SpongeBob stuff, right. and obviously, like that's when they had not as much of a budget and everything. So, I like, think they all, had the, all the iconic sounds, like boom, 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 right. boom, boom. Yeah, that's that's just like right. Yeah, free, free license. I think some of that actually had to take out because there was like some like it somehow became licensor. I, I I don't know the exact what happened there but um you know what other well, show when we do spongebob men we'll be able to sure. like rewatch it and piece that out together you know what other show did something similar with their music i want to hear from it. around this time 1999 or mad men time uh no around uh spongebob time um i don't know it's always sunny in philadelphia oh yeah that, that show i don't watch yes are you gonna <laughs> at least watch a little bit of it before our blackberry review pass why i'm busy i'm catching up on succession i just started season four what do you want yeah i still i'm almost done with season two i'm way ahead of you well i know how the tides have turned for a while i know how the tides have turned (laughs) but mike's the farthest ahead of both of us right because mike you're you're aren't you caught up on what succession yeah yeah i don't even think i've never oh sorry i'm thinking i'm sorry i'm thinking of somebody else who has your exact name uh but it's not Uh, you. sure yeah Yeah. well there is another michael overholst my uncle that's who you're thinking of Yes. Does he, yeah, he and I are in touch. Succession, your uncle? No, my my uncle is my grand uncle, and he uh, loves talking about the Vietnam War and Donald Trump. There is a there is a really great joke about Succession in the movie Joyride, uh, the new mm. one coming out in July, um, and it made me a lot of, a lot of jokes in that that movie made me laugh out loud. But that one, I was I was really really cackling. You were laughing and nodding in recognition and like yeah exactly. Well, I think it's it's funny even if you've never heard of like or if you've never watched Succession, you probably heard of it, right? So like I think like the the idea behind the joke, which I won't give away, is uh, funny enough. But it's obviously well, funnier if you know the show. I'm on. I'm on TikTok, so I, I I feel very up to date with Succession. I'm on TikTok oh, and Twitter. That's all you need. <laughs> oh. Like I can sing you the whole L to the O G. Hmm. Do I just the watched O-G-A-N, that episode? A and he playing. I just watched that one. <laughs> um. Uh, all right. But uh, you know, it's a show on HBO uh, about some privileged, uh, overbearing children try to take over their father's legacy it's even better than succession. righteous gemstones that's right uh no thank you john you i know We've it's close to home for you but you should it's so good it's like it's ridiculous enough where it's not going to give you any type of jerry falwell ptsd i promise no thanks <laughs> okay that's fine. the righteous the righteous men stones that's what we would call it the righteous men stones yeah. success men um yeah and then barry just would still be called barry yeah i mean what else you want um i'm not i'm also not watching barry at the moment the new season but uh, i do plan to check it out pretty soon i love barry it's much better than succession i would agree no kidding but i haven't seen the new season of succession so i cannot compare i haven't given it much thought of like what the shows are so different to me i haven't i haven't really done that exercise of like do i prefer one well, or the other because they air back to back on sunday so that's why people compare i see to. so they yeah because i was doing that same thing with game of thrones and silicon valley um but okay sure let's go away and leave 